If you started collecting sneakers before 2012, chances are you did it because of an athlete. Whether you started with Jordan, LeBron, or even Stan Smith's, athletes have always been at the forefront of sneaker culture. And that makes sense. Every development in sneaker technology has been forced by the needs of athletes who require better performing shoes than the rest of us. Brands advance their sneaker tech, and it's the athletes who are at the cutting edge of play that stand to get the most use from them. And if an athlete plays better, the shoe will sell better. On this episode of From the Ground Up, we're going to go over how the role of the athlete has changed from the inception of sneaker culture to today. The implication from these shoes has always been that if you wear them, you can play like the player. You needn't look any further than the famous 1992 Be Like Mike commercial that underlines the relationship between product and personality. That commercial was about Gatorade, but reverberates out to all endorsement products. Up until 2012, the biggest names in footwear were all athletes, but then that changed. It's not just that the role of the athlete changed in sneakers, the role of the athlete changed in the world writ large. And we're going to get into how and why that changed a little bit later. But right now we have Rux Bengston in the studio to give us an extensive look at how athletes have driven the history and industry development of sneakers. If we're gonna talk about the role of the athlete in sneaker culture, it's best to go back to the beginning. Not only did American sprinter Jesse Owens upstage Germany's best athletes on their own turf in the 1936 Olympics, he did it while wearing their shoes. Owens ran in spikes made by Adi Dossler, the Adi and Das of Adidas. And while Adidas wouldn't be founded as an actual brand until 1949, the groundwork had been laid. When Adidas developed the first all-leather tennis shoe back in 1965, they named it for French pro Robert Halle. Rather than discontinue a successful model, and when Halle retired, they simply renamed it, passing it on to a young American named Stan Smith. That name stuck. Smith won singles titles at the US Open in 71 and Wimbledon in 72. When Nike started, they did so as a track and field company, even before the name was settled on. The muse was a young Oregon runner named Steve Prefontaine, Pre for short. He was Phil Knight's Jesse Owens. His name wasn't on the shoe, but his performance was behind everything they did, and would-be customers knew it. In basketball, Converse had a stranglehold on pro players, mostly because that was the way things had always been, since the Chuck Taylor first hit hardwood decades before the NBA was even founded. Dr. J was the closest they had to a signature athlete, with his pro leathers commonly known as Dr. J's. And when future superstars signed with the NBA, they inevitably signed with Converse as well. Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, Isaiah Thomas. But a change was coming as new brands entered the picture, with money to spend and new ideas of how signature product could work in basketball. In the summer of 1984, Bulls rookie-to-be Michael Jordan begrudgingly signed with Nike, a Portland-based company who up until then had stayed fairly local with their basketball product. They'd had a hit with 1982's Air Force One, but that shoe wasn't tied to one particular player. Super agent David Falk played a huge role in the creation of Air Jordan, demanding that his star-to-be client be treated more like a tennis player. After all, they were the ones with the big endorsement deals. Nike would have considered Air Jordan a success had it sold two to eight million dollars worth of product in that first year. Instead, it made Nike 105 million in 10 months. Patrick Ewing, the number one overall pick of the New York Knicks, drafted the year after Jordan and also represented by Falk, signed with Adidas. This was by design. Remember Wu-Tang solo members all signing with different labels? Same deal. Ewing's run with Adidas lasted barely five years before he left to start his own eponymous brand. Around the same time, Converse rethought their own approach, marketing their own stars with the introduction of the weapon in 1986. They put pretty much everybody in one commercial, a rapping-themed one featuring Magic and Isaiah, Bernard King and Kevin McHale. It ended, of course, with Larry Bird, the reigning MVP. But even they couldn't stop Nike. After Jordan came Barkley and Penny and Peyton and Pippen, Jordan's model became the norm. Nike even pulled in multi-sport athletes like Deion Sanders and Bo Jackson to sell cross trainers, a new do-everything category that Nike had created from scratch, thanks to a young designer named Tinker Hatfield. Nike defined the 90s, but Reebok, who had previously put a scare into Nike with their aerobics product in the 80s, made inroads. They signed two number one overall picks, Shaquille O'Neal in 92 and Allen Iverson in 96, both of whom made impacts on the cultural side equal to or maybe even greater than what they did on the court. By the early 2000s, signature basketball was reaching its apex. 
Nike paid $90 million to sign high schooler LeBron James in 2003 and signed former Adidas signature guy Kobe Bryant the same year. Adidas, the ones who started all of this, became symbols of the decline of athletes as influencers. Bulls guard Derrick Rose, after becoming the youngest MVP in league history, was plagued by a seemingly endless string of injuries, and Magic Center Dwight Howard, who seemed like he might become the next Shaq, just didn't find an audience. He could fill a stat sheet, but no one wanted to buy his shoes. Today in 2018, there is still an abundance of signature athletes in the NBA. James is on his 15th shoe, Retro Jordans still fly off shelves, Under Armour built their basketball shoe brand around Steph Curry, while Jordan gave Russell Westbrook a signature on-court model just this past season. But while the athletes themselves still view a signature shoe as a significant milestone in the quest for superstardom, sneaker connoisseurs and trendsetters are looking elsewhere, to entertainers, and even to what athletes wear off the court instead of on it. Like Russ just said, sneaker fans now look to entertainers as role models in the way that they used to look to athletes. As the entertainer, entrepreneur, and fashion insider rose, sneaker culture was dominated by collaborations in 2012, so the sneakers of athletes began to fall away. Suddenly, it wasn't that artists were wearing athlete sneakers, the athletes began wearing the collaborations on court. Once everyone was paying more attention to non-athlete sneakers, the athletes began to do the same. What's up, guys? I'm here with Noah Neiman of Rumble Boxing and Mr. Fomer Simpson of the YouTube. Welcome, guys. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks Thank you, guys. So I want to start with you, Fomi. You grew up in New York. I did. And as you know, a big sports fan who watched athletes and the sneaker industry sort of move at the same time, when was the first time that you saw a pair of shoes on an athlete and was like, I need that now? For me, I'd say it was probably Penny Hardaway. I was a huge Penny guy, you know, Little Penny, the commercials, just everything. And when I saw the Penny One for the first time, that's what it was. I need those in my life, I need those on my feet. At the time, I couldn't afford them and you know, my mom definitely was not buying those for me. He was the guy for me, he was, that was the athlete, that was the basketball player that tied it into sneakers for me personally, yeah. So Noah, as the role of the athlete has changed, I think it's sort of like expanded who can be an athlete. And so you work really closely with Nike, I would consider you a Nike athlete. How has that sort of space change for you or, or do you see like your role as a new role in the industry or do you think it's sort of been there for a while and we're seeing it now? I think it's just a, an extrapolation of what Nike's done since its inception when you know you had you know Bo Jackson running up the walls and they used the athlete as kind of the best marketing that they could get and now I feel like I'm a conduit between the consumer and you know the brand the product so I think that Nike's really utilized you know, the non-professional athlete, so to speak, I hate this word, but fitness influencer or whatever it is, to really bridge the gap between the consumer and, and that brand. Before the advent of social media, it was like you watched these people on TV and they were on billboards. And so that distance was always just implied. It was very manicured. So you would see the, the print ads, you would see the billboards, you would see that, but that would be the extent of it. Other than that, you would just see the athlete in their uniforms, you couldn't see personality. Now, with the advent of Instagram, the athlete can really utilize fashion as, as a way to differentiate themselves and really showcase personality, where they couldn't do that when they just had their on-camera time on the court or in a manicured, you know, ad. Fumi, you do a lot with like the technical aspect of sneakers and like checking out to see if this newest basketball shoe works well right. as, a, as a shoe. What have you seen change in the last couple of years from a product perspective as the role of the athlete has changed, if anything? Yeah, I, I think that you see more now with performance sneakers trying to make them appeal off court as well. You know, more casual, but still with the tech, you know what I mean? Kind of like bridging the gap there a little bit. You know, a lot of basketball sneakers, most people aren't going to wear casually. I think that, that they will be appealing off court. So even a guy who's not going to lace them up and, and play, but he's still going to want to buy a pair and want to rock them. It's not enough for an athlete to be just an athlete anymore. Truly, it's not enough for any adult to have a singular identity or career. But since athletes have inherently limited career lengths, 
the more they can create broader appeal and a wider sense of mastery, they can extend their influence beyond the playing field. The past few years, we've seen athletes go hard into fashion, politics, and community organizing. Shut up and dribble just doesn't work anymore as we recognize that our athletes are more than entertainers. We hear from them through social media and events beyond their games, so their shoes have to satisfy the whole human beyond what they wore to score. Few athletes have moved into a new space as successfully as Victor Cruz. What's up guys, I'm here with Victor Cruz. Thank you so much for joining us no today. No problem, thanks for having me. I think in the last couple of years, the role of the athlete in sneakers has definitely changed. Have you seen a change like that? And if so, where do you think it came from? Yeah, I do see a change. I think it just naturally came from progression of fashion, right? Obviously, the most accessible person, the most accessible celebrity, if you will, is the athlete. You know, you can see them, they're at events. I mean, obviously now so much effort has been put forth on what they wear going to the game. Where we see the biggest change is brands, as well as fashion houses, understanding that, oh, this is, this is the actual runway. These athletes walking down, going to the games. The possibilities are endless now once you get to that point where you start understanding and have someone that bridges the gap between streetwear and high fashion and, and athletics and you know the people and major markets. And then you start putting all that together and then you can have you know a Victor Cruz for Givenchy at any point in time in, in your life. As that shifted and sort of the accessibility to athletes became uh, much closer and much clearer, I think it sort of took a couple years for the brands to really catch up mm -hmm. to say as a brand hey we need to service the athlete in totality mm -hmm. instead of just as the athlete when you were creating your own shoe how much of that sort of full picture of who you are and the different industries you were touching came to play into the design uh, all of it I yeah. wanted it to be obviously it was a it was a lifestyle shoe so that was the entire component was yeah. like this isn't we're not training in this. We're not going to be running around in this. That definitely took a took a, a toll of how I wanted the shoe to be designed. You know what kind of energy I wanted to, the shoe to have, given from my personal experiences of fashion and, and sneakers, as well as what people like and what they're into. So obviously, all of that kind of played a part into everything that I was thinking about when it came to my shoe, when it came to designing it. The design is one thing, getting the shoe, but how you roll it out and how you how you want people to receive that shoe for the first time, that's a big deal. That's an important moment for your product because that's what's gonna determine you know, what people like and what they don't like, and uh, it can shape people's, you know, people's, uh, people's minds. Yeah, and you did that on late night TV. You didn't do that like at a game. I did, I wanted to, I wanted to make sure, and, I, and Nike obviously wanted to make sure that this shoe was done well, protected, as well as put on the pedestal and given the notoriety that I feel like it deserved. And I think it did great. Shout out to Jimmy Fallon, man. He he uh, he showed love. He even put the sneaker on and started dancing with me and stuff. So hopefully, uh, if we get to design more product, I can unveil everything on Jimmy Fallon. That would <laughs> that'd be dope. And so before, I think it's before we had the advent of social media, you know, we saw athletes on a late night TV show um, or just at the games or um, in the in the press before and after the games. Yeah. Do you think that's beneficial? to our culture at large that, that put athletes up here to see them as full human beings? Uh, I think it helps. I think, I think the athlete loves it, right? Because now you don't have to be the LeBron James or the Steph Currys of the world or you know Kevin Durant's of the world to get notoriety or to, get, or to be seen. You can have a following on Instagram. You can have a, a personality. You can show you know, what type of person you are and that can garner interest from either brands or just you know, people that just want to spend money on you because they got to know you better and they're like, oh, we can market that, we can use that. Something like J.R. Smith, obviously, obviously everybody knows him and knows who he is, but because of his personality, him joining up with Supreme for the NBA collab was perfect. There, there could be no other person that can embody what Supreme was trying to do. I think the athletes love that. They get to show themselves and show who they truly are, and it brings kind of the negativity to some athletes to light. Sometimes you might not want to work with that person. It's good and bad, but I think it's, it's mostly helping more than it's hurting. The relationship between the athlete and the sneaker industry changed dramatically between 2012 and 2018, and nowhere is that more evident than in LeBron's signature sneaker line. LeBron's signature line really shows the tension between function and fashion and how they finally came together earlier this season. 
So if you start with the LeBron 8, obviously these shoes flew off the shelves, especially we're looking at the South Beach. You know, this is one of those shoes that has maintained its value throughout the years, continues into the LeBron 9 through the Big Bang. But then it was the LeBron 10 where things started to change and that's when collaborations and entertainment sneakers really started to pop off. So then we move into the LeBron 10. And of course, there were some colorways that really popped off, especially the corks and uh, these Scooby-Doo's. Um, but what was really interesting about the shoe is that it, they really went into this futuristic thing. You know, it's all smooth, it's all sort of flat. Customers are being primed to really enjoy a rich, retro look. And that's the opposite of what is happening here. What's sort of interesting and unfortunate and sort of the point of all this is Nike really doubled down on this futurism aspect. So we get the 11, uh, we get the 12, and once again, you know, it's sort of stepping away from what the customer has really been primed to look for over this era of sneakers. It doesn't really get any better until we get to the 15, and this is by design. Nike really let the customer lead rather than trying to lead the customer. It becomes really clear why the LeBron 15 worked, and it's because they used outside eyes and started to really pay attention to style rather than just performance. And who better to help them out with that than Ronnie Feig? Ronnie has been one of the most prolific collaborators from the last decade, and so they brought him on to really help make this shoe work. When you look at what makes these shoes work compared to, say, the nine, you know, what was working about the 9 is that it, it felt like a real basketball shoe that was also had all the details that got lost in the 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Instead of continuing to go down that road of basketball, obviously the LeBron 15 is at the top of what it means to be an athletic shoe, but it's really about the look. Like we talked about before, moving the athlete into the entertainer space, seeing them through more than just on the field or on the court, we need more from these shoes than just performance. With the LeBron 15, we're finally seeing Nike embrace LeBron James, not just as an athlete, but as a full lifestyle brand. It's taken off in the market and really started a new generation for LeBron's signature line. We're finally seeing brands recognize that the role of the athlete in 2018 has changed from the way it's always been, as the culture has expanded the role of the athlete in our wider community. As the world shifts, we can no longer pretend that athletes are just athletes, and so we want more than a technical sneaker if we're going to take a piece of their legacy. That's it for this episode. If you guys liked what you saw, don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a comment down below with the first signature sneaker you ever bought. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with our next episode all about hype. I'm sure you guys have a lot to say, and we look forward to hearing back from you.